taking essentially prediction of the weather beyond just routine numerical weather prediction. So essentially beyond 10 days. And then, uh, so this is going to be uh, Wednesday morning. And then Wednesday afternoon, we're going to be talking about energy balance models, paper time, and tipping points. And nonlinear and stochastic models. So this is sort of more on the dynamical system side. Non-autonomous and random dynamical systems. And then as a way of trying to connect the observations with theory, advanced spectrum methods, in particular single spectrum analysis, related methods. And finally, as an example of an illustration, an illustration of all these things brought together, they will be applied to the winter. Okay, so next one, please. Okay, so uh, observations and basic uh, and uh, basic planetary flow theory. So general introduction and motivation, scale dependence of atmospheric or atmospheric and oceanic flows, chaos turbulence and predictability, basic facts of large scale atmospheric life. Uh, this title comes actually when I was still, after doing my PhD with Peter Lacks at the Plant Institute, I stayed there on the faculty for another 10 years. And during that interval, it was Jim York, a very well known figure in mathematical systems, from the University of Maryland, who invited me to give a talk there. And at that point, I first tried to uh, describe, as you know, one refers in general to basic facts of life, case of basic facts of large scale atmospheric life. And uh, so uh, the atmospheric heat engine and then the main ingredients of so-called planetary flow and physical fluid dynamics, uh, shallowness and rotation. And then we'll start with uh, flow regimes, bifurcations and symmetry breaking in a laboratory device, uh, which I'll show you, uh, well, I'll show you pictures of. Uh, rotating differential heat with annulus and its regime diagram and transitions. So, again, now while I spend most of my time doing crazy in Paris, I still spent more of my career in the United States, in the United States where I used to be in Iraq. So, you know, for all those in the room, if anything that I say, you know, it's not clear or you're curious about something, please interrupt, you know, polite. Please interrupt. For those online, well, you'll have to communicate with Stefano, but uh, I will try to leave time at the end for questions and discussion. So, uh, weather and climate, variability and prediction. So again, it's in the nature of the climate sciences that uh, prediction in time is an important goal. This is not necessarily so when you do what's called wet chemistry. Chemistry that you do in high school uh, or certain aspects of experimental physics. But uh, in these uh, climate sciences or more broadly environmental sciences, Prediction in the sense of forecasting in time is an important motivation. And of course, the point of view of dynamical systems is closely related to this concern. Uh, while actually a lot of meteorologists think that Ed Lorenz invented chaos, and this is chaos, we know that uh, that's not so, that there was work of Poincaré and Rama much earlier, talk a little bit about that later today or uh, Wednesday. Uh, but uh, still, uh, the contribution of Ed Lorenz was actually one best known example of the free protection model, and then there were some other models along the lines, in which clearly his motivation was to understand the difficulties with the electrical so, variability and predictability. So, this comes from the United States National Weather Service. This is a so-called forecast suite, 
these are various products okay, that require rather different approaches to a different extent based on observations. So today, data driven, and on the other hand, models to predict. So basically, we start, uh, you know, from the shortest time scales over here to the longest time scales over there. And so, uh, you know, U.S. hazards assessment, watches, warnings, uh, tornadoes are very localized phenomena, but that can cause huge harm. So this is what's sometimes called now casting. You look at the weather and they say, oops. The tornado forming, and it's going to my bar. And it's going to give the wizard a box. See that movie, and if not, you should. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there are all sorts of other things that uh, need to be forecasted. So, as you move on to longer, to longer times, okay, from now casting to seasonal and interannual forecasting. In some sense, you have to think about larger scales in space and longer in time. So there's less and less detail that you can forecast. So we know very well today that it is impossible to forecast rainfall over Pisa next year at this time, of, you know, on this day of the calendar. Okay? But maybe we can forecast mean temperatures over the entire Mediterranean or all of Europe over a month, one year from now. At least the whole thing. So again, this concept of the connection between uh, space and time scales and um, uh, between uh, the amount of detail that becomes smaller and smaller to proceed longer time scales and larger space scales are very strongly connected. Next slide. So uh, in principle, I don't know whether you are planning to give grades on this course or anything, but from time to time I have provided such problems. If you want to be sure that you haven't wasted your time sitting here, it's good to just do those problems for yourself. Okay? So find the latest, so the, I put on the previous slide, I put the word historic. This was, I think I found that slide in 2014, I gave this course at, uh, in London. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's not exactly the same today because these things change as computers become bigger, satellites provide more detail, and even people get better ideas. So, uh, find the latest forecast feed on the National Weather Service website and the comparable forecast feeds on the website so that you can find the Ecological Agency, the Chief Ecological Office, the European Center that you all know about, the Metro France. I know that the situation with respect to weather forecasting in Italy is not the best one. I don't know what it's still in uh, aeronautica. Okay. So, uh, you know, in the United States, what's called modern numerical weather prediction started in the early 60s in what was called a joint unit of several military services for forecasting and the people was at the time the numerical uh, weather, the national weather service. So that was in the, in the 1960s, okay? And by now all these other countries have their weather services or Europe has it. You know, they, these are some of the leading agencies. Okay, next one, please. So, in order to illustrate uh, more in greater detail this connection between time scale and uh, horizontal scale, I will explain on one of the subsequent slides. Uh, I mentioned the fact that what characterizes planetary flows is uh, the so-called aspect ratio between very large horizontal scales and very small vertical scales. We're going to come back to that in a moment, but let's just talk about the horizontal scales. So, you know, we go here from hours to years and here from 
10 kilometers to 10,000 kilometers. So this is roughly you know, the order magnitude of the planet. So uh, what's very interesting is that these phenomena are organized essentially along a most of the energy is on this close to this diagonal. So here you have convection of thunderstorms and say tornadoes. This is what is called mesoscale variability, mesoscale cloud complexes. So this is you know, days and hundreds of kilometers, and then what's called synoptic scale. The word synoptic scale here stands for the fact that the observations today are pretty much continuous in time because of the existence of satellites, both polar orbiting satellites and sort of geostationary satellites. So observations now are continuously in time, but when the World Meteorological Organization was established, and essentially roughly around World War II, um, it became, in order to achieve at least manual weather was a case before the initiative of John von Neumann and the history of advanced studies depends on the way that forecasting was done. Uh, you needed observations at the same time. And that's the word synoptic. And so the synoptic scale is a scale essentially of mid latitude eddies which produce what we usually call weather. You know, when temperature and precipitation changes substantially over a number of days, that's an eddy which is coming through. Okay? So that's a synoptic scale of uh, synoptic scale variability. So that's mid latitude eddies of traveling cyclones. And then we're coming to what I call low frequency variability. I'm going to come back to this, uh, which characterizes the alternation between blocking and other persistent anomalies versus a more normal so-called zonal flow, in other words, flow parallel to circles of light. Again, I'm going to explain that in just a few minutes. Okay, so uh, it's very amusing because I drew this diagram based on something that Klaus Friedrich, who is one of his associates, published in the Journal of Science Sciences in 1978. And these days, Klaus Friedrich shows my life. That's, you know, his words had a lot of details which are no longer the best information that exists in the Next one, please. So you have a similar situation in the oceans except that, for reasons that, again, I'll go into in just a few slides, the characteristic size of the counterpart of weather is hundreds of kilometers rather than thousands of kilometers. On the other hand, the time scale, rather than a few days, is a few months. Okay? So atmospheric low-frequency variability is what's called intraseasonal, between 10 and 100 days, basically the life cycle of these mid latitude eddies of five to seven days. And at the other end of this interval, 100 days is roughly a round figure for trying to remove the effect of changes in insulation, seasonal cycle. Okay? So, you know, if you take three months of winter versus three months of summer, you know, that's it. Sort of this upper limit of 100 days. On the other hand, in the ocean, this is essentially three to 300 years, okay, in the annual period. And again, essentially, uh, this diagram is originally due to uh, Chelsea. Um, and uh, uh, again, you have this diagonal here, but then because of these larger scales, you hit the upper bound of the size of the planet. So these last phenomena line up with this thing, which is a few times 10,000 10, kilometers. Okay? But it is roughly the same thing. And this is actually something very intriguing, the fact that the energy concentrates along these diagonals. And, uh, you know, it is something that uh, 
if the atmosphere and ocean were linear, and you know, like in quantum mechanics, the covariance commuted with the dynamics, then that, that would be the natural result. But neither one of those assumptions holds for the atmosphere and ocean. So why this is so is essentially a mystery. Okay? You know, there's, uh, there's a, I had the privilege, aside from the last, uh, well, having a little bit of his advice three times during the PhD, uh, I also had the chance of working with Sidney Geary, Goldstein, well, he was his assistant in the last course he gave, and uh, Sidney was a great figure of fluid dynamics, I mean, he's a real author of this thing that you know, the modern development. Dynamics, and there was a committee, and uh, he was asked to write the first article in the annual reviews of fluid mechanics, okay, which was called something like fluid mechanics over the last 50 years. And then he said about Sir Horace Lamb, who had written a book called Hydrodynamics, that uh, Lamb said, when I die and go to heaven, I would like to be uh, enlightened about two things. One is uh, uh, oh, uh, some, something in quantum mechanics, get the exact term, and the other one is turbulence. And I'm rather optimistic about the first one. Okay? And so Sidney commented, uh, well, uh, Sir Horace was right on both attacks. Anybody who knew him was sure that he would go to heaven. And the openness of the still form of the concept of turbulence. Okay? So, when whatever happens uh, later, I would like to be enlightened. This is one of the things that I'd like to be enlightened about. Why do I think why I'm going to happen? Okay? Uh, next one, please. Okay, so this is sort of an artist picture of climatic variability on very long time scales. I'm sure that I don't have to explain to people here or online what uh, a power spectrum is, but you know, of course, we do not have data, you know, detailed data, all the ways so that the units here are, uh, you know, uh, in inverse of years, cycle per year, okay, all the way from seconds to uh, tens of millions of years, and actually the original plot is due to Murray Mitchell, who published a version of this diagram in uh, the uh, primary research uh, in 1976. There are many versions of this one comes from an article in the encyclopedia of global environmental change. Uh, basically, what we're looking at here, uh, you know, the synthesized data, you see that most of the variance is in a continuous spectrum. Now, at this point in time, we do not know how much of that is uh, really stochastic versus uh, deterministic chaos. In any case, it's continuous. There's relatively little that you can say in detail about it, although most of the variance is there. Then there are some lines. So this is the rotation of the Earth around its axis, and this is the revolution of the Earth around the sun and precisely on the mass center of the planetary system, but which lies within the sun, and then there's some harmonics thereof. And then the most interesting part are these broad peaks, which are not neither really continuous spectrum nor actual purely periodic functions. And at the time when Murray Mitchell wrote this paper, there was this is a literal quotation from that paper. It said no known source of deterministic internal variability. Now, this year, 1976, coincides with the year in which Klaus Hasselmann, who, as you probably know, shared last year's uh, Nobel Prize in Physics with Suki Manado and Georgia Parisi. Klaus Hasselmann, the same year, published a paper in which essentially he said climate is brown in motion, where weather being molecular hits, and, you know, Slower, slower times uh, in uh, particles of pollen, uh, rays of pollen that Brown observed uh, do when 
where I hit my all these molecules. So that was in the same year. That was a dominant conception of climate variability, you know, more specifically for the Klaus Hasselmann talk of the ocean as being uh, uh, something that low pass filters white noise into infrared. So, uh, my view on this, uh, going back, so this is the year after my PhD, uh, my, my idea was that these broad peaks are essentially uh, due to hot bifurcations, so then you get slightly diffused by interactions between multiple instabilities. So, that's essentially the view. That uh, where the is brought to the issue of turbulence, you know, instead of having given an infinite number of multiple bifurcations, you have a bifurcation tree, etc. We are going to talk more about this in this series of lectures. Okay, next one. Well, this is called the Francis Breveton Horendogram of Earth System Science. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you can't see this, the, the title. Uh, this was due to the fact that um, uh, NASA, so the United States uh, uh, National uh, uh, Aeronautics and Space Agency, um, had done some successful exploration of several planets and satellites that are in the solar system. And somebody had that bright idea that it might be nice to look at our own planet. Okay? So they named an advisory council uh, for to look at what was called, I think, for the first time, the Earth System Science. And this is Francis Breveton, a uh, uh, British scientist who moved to the United States, first as a professor at Johns Hopkins and later. National Center for Atmospheric Sciences in Boulder. And so you see that it's complicated. Uh, well, basically, here you have the atmosphere, and uh, here you have uh, the ocean, which had not really had barely been coupled in one model at that time. So this was pretty innovative to think about it that way. This atmospheric physics and dynamics, dynamic cloudiness, radiation, this physical climate system. Okay, and then sorry, so this is sea, you know, the open ocean, sea ice, marginal seas, etc. Uh, terrestrial surface margin, etc. And here is what started to be called biogeochemical cycles at that time. And now there are now there are several journals that have biogeochemical in their title. Okay, and for some reason that. I don't quite know. Soil development ended in the middle of this or in the ground. And then somewhere around there, there are see the, uh, you know, sources of information like deep sea sediment cores, uh, so system influence, volcanism, so space physics, uh, deep sediment, ice cores. There's a little thing over here human activities and impacts on, on and off human activities. Okay? So, uh, you know, we are trying to integrate all these pieces of the puzzle into one concept that will help us eventually predict uh, what sort of world you guys are going to be advanced, are going to be living in later in life. So, uh, you know, again, this is something that I like to emphasize that why we clearly started with. We clearly see that we're having an excessive effect on the planet. That does, and we know enough in order to act from that. That does not mean that we understand the system. So there are all sorts of statements that you can see even on the websites of certain academies of sciences that, you know, and problem is solved. Now do something about it. Yeah, do something about it is true. We know enough for that, but we know everything is far. That's why I hope you are here next. Okay, so in order to understand this complexity, what the climate sciences have developed is a concept of a hierarchy of models. Not 
There are also things that are called hierarchical models, networks, and so on. Here we're talking about several models, not just one. Okay, so you know you can think about the system as being equilibrium, quasi-equilibrium. Actually, try to look at transients and time of utility in space. You go from zero dimensional, in other words, from averaging the entire planet to a point to one dimensional, either in the vertical, where you look at so called, uh, you use radiative convective models in order to look at this balance between incoming radiation and outgoing radiation as it is affected by cloudiness and all that stuff, or one dimensional in, uh, in uh, for example, space latitude in particular. So called energy balance models that we will deal with on Wednesday, and then on to two dimensional, which can be in a horizontal plane. This is when you do a certain kind of simplified dynamics on the surface of the planet, trying to average over the vertical, or in a meridional plane, where you try to combine essentially what radiative convective models do and energy balance models do. And then finally, uh, three dimensional general circulation models. Well, this is a residue from my moving from this year later to call it now. Fifty cents. Sorry about this. It's a little uh, imperfection of the slide. So again, uh, simple and intermediate two D and three D models, and then coupling of partial unidirectional of asynchronous hybrid, hybrid, and now more typically. And the idea of the hierarchy is that you move from the simplest to the most elaborate and uh, in an iterative way, and of course, with due respect for the observation. So, you know, the simple models or conceptual models are for developing ideas, and then you move across the hierarchy, and you have these very detailed models, which you can't now with a lot of data. And if you've explained something, you're done, and you can move to the next problem, and if you're not done, you have to go back. Next, please. So, I mentioned uh, something about uh, uh, chaos turbulence and predictability. So, actually, so in Italy, this was a title of, uh, of course, uh, 88 of the International School of Physics and Physical Training. And actually, uh, I happen to be the director of that course, and Roberto Benzi and Giorgio Parisi, the same one that I mentioned before, were the secretaries of the course. It was actually, to the best of my knowledge, the only time that the course had two secretaries. Unfortunately, Giorgio was actually pretty sick during those two weeks, but he wrote an appendix, the rules of the system. Such a kind of analytic is that the series of books can only contain the lectures of the invited lecturers. But Derrière had the wonderful idea of letting Giorgio write up what's called the multi factors as an appendix to his lectures. And the reason this course is most often quoted is because of that thing, which is quoted as fresh and Parisian, where Derrière insists. Parisian okay. So clearly, you know, chaos and turbulence have something to do with well, obstacles to predictability. Next one, please. So here are essentially two sources of, of unpredictability. Uh, one is deterministic chaos, and again, I will not go into this in detail at this point. I will sort of come back to it uh, maybe later. But uh, you've all seen the, you know, the, the butterfly, uh, the two wings of the, the butterfly, and this is a, just a sample trajectory. And actually, this was this plot comes from a paper of mine with a, from, with a colleague, Kate Simo in the uh, late 80s, in which we tried to illustrate for those people who have not taken that question in private theory that I mentioned earlier, that deterministic chaos has statistics just like stochastic processes. Okay. Again, you know, doing these things right mathematically is much more complicated than that, 
But uh, one of the big bouts that went up in my mind in those days was precisely that you can do spectral theory of deterministic chaos pretty much with the same practical tools as the one developed for time series that were in thought to be generated by stochastic processes. Okay, next one. So, problem two, find a problem, oh, and you don't have to, you know, do what your hands did in 1963, come up with a numerical method to do this yourself. There's plenty of software. That web, find some software to compute the Lorentz butterfly and you need to do so. You know, it's a little game. Well, you, you can get animations on the web. It's much more amusing to do it yourself. Uh, okay, next one. So this is one source of uh, uh, loss of editability, okay, positive gapping transformants and so on, that we should discuss later in greater detail. The other one is, uh, well, essentially fully developed turbulence, uh, which, as I said before, we still don't understand, but there's still an outstanding price, aside from, you know, boundless glory, there's one million dollars from the some foundation uh, lying there for the person to solve problems. Okay. So the energy spectrum of the atmosphere and oceans is full. All space and time scale are active and they all contribute to forecasting uncertainties. This is a particular, particularly popular spectrum. So again, from a series of papers actually by these two people, Nastra and Gage, in the mid 80s, again in the journal. Sciences at times, spectral density versus wave, wavelengths and kilometers. And this is for meridional wind, so in other words, for north south wind. And this one is for zonal wind, for east west wind. And as you can see, interestingly, they seem to align with two separate slopes. K to the minus three at the large scales corresponds to what's called geostrophic turbulence, or you know, turbulence squish and rotating, or it's also true in MHD, little hydrodynamic in certain problems, and uh, two-dimensional turbulence, and K to the minus five thirds is at the uh, at the uh, shorter wavelength where you can think really of the turbulence that can be That's something that you normally worry about turbulence in the first place. to the minus five thirds with model, etc. So uh, actually in the atmosphere they uh, you know there's some sort of uh, smooth transition between the two, but that's basically what is going on. So uh, the idea is that one can imagine that the longest or slowest case contributes most to the longest term forecast, and yet fully developed turbulence is obviously one such additional source of irregularity. So, next one, please. Again, I'm sure that you are not really following everything I'm saying, so please interrupt if you really have a problem. Okay? Now, basic facts of large scale atmospheric life, the atmospheric heat energy. Next, please. So basically, you know, the, the atmosphere is a very low efficiency heat energy. It's very risky. What you, what you see is, so this is the so-called direct Hadley circuit energy, close to the equator. Happening is you get solar equation, solar radiation coming in at the equator and going out of the poles. And you can think of this as being a room in which you have a stove here and a window there. And so the air rises at the equator and goes and comes down near the window. Now, this so called thermally direct circulation is pretty much what happens on Venus. It is not what is happening on Earth. In other words, the air that rises close to the equator, okay, that goes up here, doesn't make it all the way to the pole, it only makes it roughly to the tropics. Okay? 
Okay? So you do have air going up here and coming down there. And then, because of this, the Coriolis, okay, the air near the, when it comes back down to the surface, instead of being able to move directly back to the equator, is deviated to the right and you get the sort of train or alize, French, I don't know what you Okay, so these are the trade winds. You know, the British were practical, so they called the trade winds because they affected actually the shipping industry as it was at the time using sails. Okay. And so what happens in the mid latitudes is that you have a so called indirect cell. You know, by continuity, by mass continuity, since the air is going down here in the subtropics in the Hadley cell, it also has to be going down in the so called Ferrell cell, which is, however, the reason it's dashed is because it is not really driven thermal. It's something, it's a more complicated phenomenon. And the result is that the surface winds are, as they're called in English westerlies, uh, in French, it's from west, you know, you say where they're coming from, okay? And uh, so basically, they are westerly throughout the atmosphere. While here in the tropics, you have substantial shear between trade winds going near the surface like this and the opposite way at uh, higher altitudes, in the mid latitudes, everybody moves east. But with it still with a certain shear, the winds are pretty weak near the surface because of surface friction and stronger up in the uh, in close to the troposphere and are coming to this next cell. So and then there's another, there's a smaller polar cell, which is also less well defined, which again is direct, but not as simple as the one close to the to be okay, uh, incidentally, uh, this book, which I wrote with a colleague, Steve Childress, is also well known in uh, geomagnetism and a lot of uh, fluid dynamics of flight and so on, based on the course we gave together, it was first published in 1987, just after I had moved from the Grand Institute to UCLA. But it was republished in PDF by Schirmer in 2012. Okay? You can actually find it on the web. I'm sorry, it doesn't make any money for me, or at least nothing that is worth talking about. But I think you know it's very amusing that uh, the latest the latest issue of Cyan News, I don't know how many of you are members of Cyan, yet Cyan News talks about a book on American linear algebra which was republished after 25 years as being a big event. I was pretty amused, you know, 1987 to 2012. So anyhow, um, you know, it's basically uh, the book is basically a counterpart of, of the thing that was done for ecosystems by um, uh, uh, the guy who was uh, by a science advisor, Tony Blair. Ah, uh, Bob Mack, Lord, Lord of Oxford. Okay, so Brian is an Australian who was a professor Princeton, when he became interested in ecosystems, he brought dynamic systems. Model writing this book was doing that kind of sciences. Okay, so uh, fine. Done with the heat engine for the moment. Next, please. Okay, shallowness. Next. So uh, the horizontal scale, as you saw from the, uh, from the schematic diagram on the previous slide, the horizontal scale is basically dictated by the radius of the planets, it's 700 kilometers, 
Uh, and the vertical scale is only about 10 kilometers. So these motions are clearly pretty flat. So what's called the aspect ratio, H to L, is much less than one, and so the flow is approximately two-dimensional. Now, uh, there are a number of words which are used in a slightly different sense in general fluid dynamics, which is dominated by engineering and in geophysical fluid dynamics. So the trophic in general fluid dynamics just means that uh, density is only a function of pressure. Here, biotropic essentially means that uh, there's no dependence on height. Okay. So hence, the good approximation is governed by shallow water equations. So I hope that everybody here and online is familiar seeing these equations at least once. Yes? No? But you have done some fluid dynamics. Yeah. Okay. So it's a very simplified version of uh, Euler equations, okay. um, in which you have an additional term. Okay. So shallow water equations would be uh, in general without this f would be equal to zero. This f is called the Euler's parameter. So this is a material derivative of the eastward velocity. Uh, phi is the so-called geopotential, so it's essentially the height of the free surface multiplied by the acceleration of gravity. And I'm using substance I, where I come from. Uh, one of the main features of a mathematician is laziness. I don't like the partial derivative of the new substance. So these are partial derivatives with respect to Tx and Y. Material derivative, okay? So the, in the horizontal direction, this is the gradient of the geopotential, essentially the uh, uh, height of the free surface, which is the order of H. Same for V, so it's, a, it's the same operator as the material derivative, except that now the derivative is going to Y. And these terms correspond to the motion in a rotating frame, which is attached to the tangent plane to the planet. Okay. And then the mass continuity uh, is given by this equation. Okay. Now, um, I will have to tell you why you get these additional terms which clearly are the ones, well, it will be clear after the next slide or the one after that, it's the same thing that I told you rotates the motion to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Because the southern hemisphere must require at least stands on this head. Uh, it's very, this is, I don't know whether I'm using or soft coincidence, but I remember when learning about these things, this classical example is what happens to the rivers in Ukraine. Okay? The Dnieper, the Dniester, and the Don all are deflected right. Okay? So these days we speak about Ukraine in other terms, but that is a good example of the Coriolis force. So again, it's just something that has to do with motion in the outer frame uh, in the northern hemisphere. Next one, please. The free surface is a tropopause. It's coming, it's coming up right on the slide. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll introduce the exception slide. Okay, so um, this, uh, so this uh, very low aspect ratio also implies that the flow is approximately hydrostatic. In other words, the vertical derivative of the pressure is equal to minus rho g. Well, again, you're taking rho here to be constant, so it is less than zero. In other words, you can use what is called pressure coordinates. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between vertical z 
which increases and pressure which decreases uniformly with height in this approximation, which is true on average for these large scale motions. Okay. And so typically, you think about there is no free surface, you know, the stuff just gets thinner and thinner with, uh, with altitude. Okay. But you can think of this point when the profile, instead of pressure decreases, starts to increase. This is a sort of focal point. This is roughly the height at which planes fly. Okay. So you can use pressure coordinates, which have certain advantages, and you can just invert the partial derivative here. So the z with respect to p equal to minus one over p. And if you also include temperature, you get an equation like this. So uh, it's very amusing that actually, you know, there is a, there is a, a broadcast on French uh, public radio, France Culture, which is called uh, La Méthode Scientifique, Scientific Method. And they just had an emission on the jet stream. You can go on uh, France Culture and just do jet stream, and they're going to stumble upon this emission uh, that uh, where there were three, four people on it. And aside from myself, there were two people who were descendants of me. Uh, you know, one great grandson, a great grandson, Stephen Hicks. So the jet stream is a very amusing object. You see, you could think that in general, because you have more heat at the equator and, and less at the pole, you know, this tropopause would be higher at the equator than it is at the pole. It's squished here, but it's colder. But this decrease of tropopause height with latitude is um, not, you know, not smooth. There are the so-called tropopause gaps in which these jet streams sit. So again, I have now to come. Okay, this is where we're going to have a little bit of difficulty. Can we go back to Slides, yes. See, we're coming, we're coming again to this stuff. So basically, I'm going to talk about this again. Uh, in this approximation, you are used in general, sorry, in general you the flow is from high pressure to low pressure. Here, because of rotation, and rotation is really important, you see. When the Rossby number is small, it is dominated by the Coriolis force, and so the flow is perpendicular to the pressure gradient. It's not along the pressure gradient from high to low, it is perpendicular to the pressure gradient. Okay? So that's why now in the tropical gaps you have the jet stream. Please go back, I mean, go forward. Please. Yeah. Okay? So these. These are the so-called subtropical jet and the subpolar jet. Subtropical jet is always there. The subpolar jet is a little bit a matter of season. Basically, these jet streams are, if you wish, atmospheric rivers, which are very large intensification because they correspond. You know, the in, the the speed is proportional to the pressure gradient. It's perpendicular to the pressure gradient, proportional to its value. So these are what the mean uh, velocity of these very large scales in the atmosphere might be a few meters per second. This is a hundred meters per second or more. Actually, the jet streams were discovered by American pilots during World War II who were flying across the Pacific to bomb the Japanese. And they found that the plane was stationary in the atmosphere. If you are in the core of the jet with the propeller planes at that time, you could not fly against the jet. So they tried to avoid it. Okay? But 
this was, well, one positive result. World War II that the dead streets were discovered. Okay, and the width is also only a few tens of kilometers versus these hundreds of kilometers go from the uh, equator. Okay, so this is a general picture. Next one, please. Okay, rotation. So, you know, it's hard to talk about the one without the other, but I have to go into a rotation tour, so let's look at it in greater detail now. Uh, I'm going to stop for a bit soon, but not yet. Let's go. Okay, rotation and geostrophy. So, essentially, geostrophy is a great word which refers to this property of the flow essentially being perpendicular to the pressure gradient. So this f, it's unfortunate, but this is a tradition, you know, in mathematics, we're used to f being the function, f for function, but here it is a so-called planetary vorticity or Coriolis parameter. It's equal to two omega, where omega is the angular velocity of the rotation of the Earth on its axis. And uh, this is a sign of latitude, okay? So it is maximum at the pole, it's it's equal to one at the pole and zero at the equator. So geostrophy breaks down near the equator, but only very close to the equator. It's very interesting that actually, when you uh, when you do the dimensional analysis of the equations of motion, because you have to do it, you don't have the time to do it, etc. But of course, uh, you realize that it's only very close to the equator, like ten or even five degrees that the, uh, you know, that the flow is really equatorward near the surface. Okay. So the Raspi number is, it measures the importance of rotation, so it's a characteristic velocity divided by F times the characteristic length. It's important if epsilon is very small. In purely geostrophic flow, the shallow water equations are reduced just to these so-called diagnostic equations because of the importance of forecast in these disciplines. Okay? One talks about an equation which is time independent as being diagnostic and one in which there is a time derivative as being prognostic because you use it for forecasting. Okay? So the flow is parallel to isobaric contour rather than perpendicular, and the psi, which is essentially proportional to the height of the free surface, is the stream function. And this is something that if you look at weather maps, these days you can have on the web, you know, a lot of weather maps very easily. Um, and you have to think of these contours of your potential as being essentially stream functions. The worm essentially follows these lines. In the quasi geostrophic approximation, epsilon is not zero, but it's very small, and it allows for small, slow deviations from exact values. Uh, incidentally, uh, it's not terribly useful to, to take notes because these are on the web. And uh, the Creative Commons license. You know, on the website where it says Zemo Go DOI, whatever, you click on that DOI and you get the version. It's not going to be the exact version because I've been changing these from one time and give the course to another one, but it's going to be very close. Okay? Sorry, I should have said that before. Okay. Uh, so, uh, shall we make a 10 minute break? Okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, I remember that uh, one of my first uh, 
teachers and then colleagues at the current institute, Joe Keller, also moved to West at some point in Stanford, used to say he was actually the, a very good uh, speaker, expository speaker, and he would hold the special Christmas seminar at the current institute. He used to say that you have to start slowly and keep everybody for about 20 minutes and then keep accelerating until at the end you've lost everybody. I think at this point we're going to have to start accelerating a little bit. So I hope that you've enjoyed what we've done so far. You know, hang in there. Okay. So uh, rotation plus shallowness gives us so for quasi-geostrophic, equivalent barotropic, potential vorticity equation of topography. That's a lot of words. So basically, this is a Laplacian. This is a so-called Raspi radius of deformation, which plays a key role. So it's a length divided by this, uh, which uh, again plays a role in this non-dimensional analysis of equations. Again, Rospi is, Carl Gustav Rospi was one of the latest figures of, uh, let's say, the first generation or second generation of dynamic meteorologists to really study with Willem Bergnes and San Jakob Bergnes and some other people in Bergen, where Carl Gustav Rospi studied, essentially long of uh, dynamic meteorology as a physical science. Physical and mathematical, and Dylan Dietrich also wrote a paper in 1904 about essentially what we call now numerical weather prediction being uh, an initial value problem for a set of partial differential equations, which are governing equations and flows. And then the story is that with World War One. Louis Fire Richardson actually tried to apply this point of view to do the first numerical weather forecast, which was taking one step on the map of Europe. So, anyhow, Rossby radius of deformation, so uh, there's the dimensions of length. And so, uh, eta is this deviation, okay? Off the free surface from a straight line or a straight surface. Okay. And so, and J is the Jacobian of this eta and the potential vorticity, which is mentioned here. Okay. So, uh, it's the derivative. And this is essentially the simplest equation that we can think of. Uh, that uh, describes mid-latitude uh, motion on scales comparable to those of these eddies that I was talking about. And so again, H uh, theta is uh, this thing. Potential vorticity is equal to this, and uh, well, it's a properly uh, modified version of the usual vorticity that applies under these circumstances of shallowness and rotation. Next one, please. Again, you can find this. In, in the references that I'll leave you with, and in particular, the children's book. A mathematical colleague of mine at, uh, at UCLA, who then moved to the University of Maryland, I don't know how many of you would know him, Wait on Pat Moore, when he hit upon this book, the Dylan children's book, which has only essentially treats with all this material in the first hundred pages. And then, okay, there's, sorry, there's another version of that, which is, in the volume uh, uh, that was edited by uh, the Marco Canassa and uh, two associates out of an in the event in Rome, in Rome, Sapienza. So when Ethan found this versus that we lost the 700 something, something called your physical free dynamics said, uh, this is it for me. 
thing is that mathematicians are mostly interested in the dynamic and systems aspects of this. I think it's a good place to look this stuff up. Okay. So uh, now we're getting a little bit there where uh, we will continue. Flow regimes, modifications, and symmetry breaking, so the whole thing being differentially heated annulus. Next. Okay, so I owe these slides actually to Peter Reed, who was a student and then a spiritual hair, Raymond Hyde. The idea is that. Uh, you are trying to reproduce what happens in the mid latitudes, in other words, from a little bit away to the equator to somewhere around the poles, in a rotating annulus, which in the laboratory looks like this and conceptually looks like this. Okay, there's warm water out here, so that's the, the air near the equator, and cold water around here, that's this. And this is the working fluid, so this is the mid latitudes. And what you're trying to reproduce in this is uh, essentially the weather index. Okay? And this is just the photograph taken from above of what happens in this rotating annulus. And this is a more detailed version. I forget exactly, I think that this is actually uh, uh, something like your potential height, uh, the counterpart in this angle. Next one, please. Okay, so regime diagram and transitions. Next. So this is actually out of a review paper. There was a meeting honoring the, I think, the 80th birthday of Raymond Hyde, who was a really remarkable contributor to geophysical fluid analysis. Basically, an apparatus like the one that I showed you before, he constructed for his PhD thesis in the 19, early 1950s. And his idea was actually to reproduce the geomagnetic field. But then he noticed that the waves on the surface of the fluid looked like weather maps. So this became uh, essentially an apparatus for doing something which is not just observations, but on the other hand, it's not just equations, which is sort of in between. It's, if you wish, an analog of the atmospheric motions. And so the pictures that you see, and I have some videos to illustrate them, you, you can show them of those in a moment, right? So you, you have those. Okay. So to summarize, we're going to look at something like this. So what happens is, can you go back uh, one slide, please? Uh, one more. So if there's no rotation, what happens is the fluid, remember that Stoven window picture that we had before, the fluid will go up here, in other words, close to the equator, and come down here, and we'll just go like that. So that will be the counterpart of the Hadley cell in this rotating annulus. Now, when I start to rotate, remember, Mr. Coriolis steps in and starts deflecting the flow to the right. So you will have essentially clockwise rotation. Okay? If you do it the opposite way with a cold fluid on the outside and warm at the inside, the rotation will be in the trigonometric sense, kind of. Okay? So if. No, no, uh, forward, forward. Go, forward. yeah, this one. So essentially, the simplest thing what happens is exactly a Hadley cell. Okay? You have the thing going up, coming down, being deflected, and you are only going to see essentially eastward motion, as a neutrally direct motion, okay? And then successively, you are going to see waves with increasing wave numbers, uh, including something that was called vacillation. In other words, in addition to the periodic motion of a wave or fixed wave number going around, you are going to see either what's called amplitude vacillation, increases in the amplitude, increases and decreases in the amplitude of the wave, 
or what is called shape vacillation or tilted trough vacillation, where the, the trough of the wave tilts one way or the other. Okay? So this, there are in the apparatus a large number of non-dimensional parameters, but the truly important ones are the rotation and the stability parameters, so this is sometimes uh, non-dimensionally given like for a Taylor number, and this is called the thermal Rossby number, usually, although it has really nothing to do with the Rossby number, and should be called the Hyde number. And in that review paper, that's, uh, this is a paper that appeared in a special issue of astronomy and geophysics, which is a uh, monthly magazine of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Astronomical Society also deals with geophysics, okay. uh, which was dedicated to Raymond's uh, 80th birthday. And um, so uh, this is reproduced from an earlier paper of Raymond and with an associate in Mason. And uh, so as I said, this is a Taylor number of this should really be called a high number. It turns out that if you want a non-dimensional number named after you, it's a good idea to have a name that starts with an R. Richardson, Rossby, uh, <laughs> I forget. Uh, uh, hmm? Rayleigh. Yeah, Rayleigh, et cetera. Okay. So uh, whatever that be, you get more and more regular motion until you hit uh, geostrophic turbulence. So you see here, this is lower symmetrical or Hadley, upper symmetrical, that's more complicated, regular waves, irregular waves. So let's look at some, uh, some of the videos. There are five videos which go from 20 seconds to about a minute or so. So it will be actually interesting to look at them. Which in, ones? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they are in this order. I think they're in the correct order. Okay. Uh, this one actually comes from uh, Raymond Hadley, uh, uh, Raymond, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, himself, and the other ones come from Peter. Uh, okay, so you see here particles at the surface of the fluid, which essentially move, just move out. Okay, uh, next. Next one. Yeah, particles. Yeah, particles. Yeah, oh, yeah, the yeah. particles which are small particles, particles floating in the fluid. Floating in the fluid. Yeah, they yeah, they are particles. Yeah. So we are just looking at the picture from above. Okay. So that's it. it that's it. Central part should be gold. Huh? The central part. Yeah. Be in this case, in, in this in in this case, it's the opposite. The way that ah, Raymond, okay. because so, because he was trying to do geomagnetics. Okay, so he had the hot stuff in the middle, in, in near the center, and the cold stuff on the outside. So they do like this. Yeah, they do the opposite, and so when it starts to rotate, it will move, it will rotate in the opposite direction. Okay. Next. Yeah, next one, please. Okay, so now you see that there's very strong flow in, uh, in the azimuthal direction. There's a wave number three that forms, and then some recirculation. So this is what's called amplitude vacillation. So these are quasi-periodic motions, okay? These are by vacation to Tor, as you know, okay? So you see that actually the periodicity of the amplitude vacillation is lower than the one of the rotation of the wave around the axis. Okay, next one please. So this is now wave number four. So as you increase the forcing, Essentially, what is happening is that you have successive breakdowns of symmetry in both space. You go from something which is purely axisymmetric to something where you have a certain wave, and in time, you go from steady state to periodic to quasi-periodic, and then eventually to irregular. Okay, 
So you see that here the amplitudes of the wave are much larger. You have recirculation both inside the wave and outside the wave. The jet stream, what you see here, essentially the counterpart of the jet stream. So you see that the jet stream can either be very much zonal or it can form things like that, which you can think of as a little bit later on. Okay. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is as I said, take the trough oscillation. You see that, you know, the, the trough uh, of the wave moves and also things become more irregular. Time. You can actually bring it to full screen. You can see that there, there is an, uh, wait, no, no. So this, you know, this happens in a fluid. This doesn't happen just in equations. Okay? It's not quite the atmosphere, of course, there are many other things. The lower surface is not uniform, you know, continents, mountains, etc. So the things are further complicated. But this starts looking like the evolution of waves on the weather map. In the videos. Next one, please. Uh, okay. So this is now turbulent motion, and you see, you see still a wave sitting there, underlying what's going on. Okay, this is quasi-geostrophic turbulence, or at least a very uh, relatively smooth version of that. The force in the area is constantly high. The force in the constantly high is just, it just uh, differential heat, the, the temperature in radiant, between the outer and the inner. In different videos, the, the force is that very high. Well, uh, it, uh, it uh, only. Okay, let's go. That's it. Let's go back to the to the picture with uh, with the regime diagram. Right. Uh, yeah, slide. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you see what happens is that each one of these lines corresponds to essentially a fixed rate of voltage. Uh, because the omega, this is not the most fortunate. In, in my book, you can see the Taylor and the uh, Berlin uh, Rossby number. Okay, omega enters both on the abscissa and on the oil. Okay, so this is what happens as you move at constant omega. And this is what happens when you change the temperature. Okay. So basically, at the fixed, the thing which is easiest to change is just the speed of rotation. To change the temperature gradient, you have to change uh, the heating of the fluid. You know, that takes longer. So moving from one line to another is more laborious, but anyhow, the, the force in here is essentially the same as in the rate of an R. Convection, except it's between the two, uh, you know, the, the, the vessels between the warm and the cold. Okay, but it is fixed in time. We're going to get the force in the changes in time later at the end of the 
Thanks very much. I mean, questions are very enlightening for everybody else. Okay, next. Next slide. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, it looks like we're pretty much done and we'll just have a discussion from now on. But uh, here are some general references. So this is an introduction to the physical dynamics, physical and numerical aspects. This is a book by Hank Dijkstra, which essentially uh, espouses this point of view of dynamical systems as had been done in this book. Uh, well, this one, yeah, it's 1987, 2012. So, um, uh, uh, as I said, you can, you can access the PDF uh, on, uh, on the web. Um, this is the one that I showed you before, turbulence and uh, predictability in GFD. Uh, actually, the book grew out of a joint paper which we plan to do, but which would eventually come out the same year as the book itself. Low frequency variability on large scale ocean separation of dynamical systems approach. Uh, well, this is a review paper that I mentioned that has all this uh, information about the annuals and its roles. You know, uh, the work of Hyde is, was really quite remarkable because. Uh, essentially, this galvanic instability that I didn't insist on, which was the bread and butter of dynamic meteorology for several decades, grew out of the PhD thesis of Joe Charney at UCLA. Uh, he actually uh, um, had almost finished the PhD thesis in the math department, had some special functions and so on. And World War II came, and so he went across town at Caltech to see Tara von Kahn, okay, who uh, had uh, fled Hungary after the Soviet Republic, which was, put, uh, you know, lasted for a few months uh, in Budapest, was put down by the fighting forces. And I never quite understood how he got it, you know, how he managed to survive in, in, in the United States uh, with that sort of background given how he But anyhow, um, John Chani went to see Toda von Karma and he asked him, what should I do to help the world? Should I do essentially engineering through dynamics, you know, airplanes and stuff, or uh, Dynamic meteorology. Jakob Gertnes, whom I have mentioned already before, had moved from Bergen to the United States and particularly to UCLA as I had before. So, so from Carmen purportedly told him, well, do dynamic meteorology because all the problems in the dynamics have been solved. So that's how Joe Chan essentially dropped his PhD thesis and started doing his other thing, which turned out to be the clinical stability. And uh, there was another form of it, which was done totally independently by an Englishman, ED, a simple form actually. But anyhow, this was the first truly three dimensional instability in three dynamics. Okay? Because it does have to do with. Uh, Flows that have a tilt. Now the vertical is horizontal dimension, vertical dimension. And so the work of Raymond Hyde, very soon after that, the work on linear biochemical instability was published in 48 and 49 by E.D. and by Charlie. And uh, I think that the first publication of uh, uh, Hayes' experiments was 53. So to do a non-linear version of this with the sort of stuff that you've seen, I mean, of course, not all of it came. The diagram comes out of a review paper in the late 60s. Anyhow, to do that was truly remarkable. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really quite happy with this paper. Anyhow, so this is a thing where you can find, I'm sorry, uh, aside from the first three chapters of this, you can find a more up-to-date version of it. In this is, I think, the first chapter, yeah, three pages, three pages one. 
the physical, so it has this expository part and then it moves directly to normal final dynamical system. This is, was uh, edited by Tarako Kamasa, Daniela Mansuki, and uh, Antonio Pokusan. Uh, Gil, Adrian Gill, no relation. Uh, this is essentially linear, but it's a very nice description to organize the production dynamics. This, of course, is uh, more of a mathematical side. Okay, the, oh, sorry, this is a review paper by Hyde and uh, Mason on sloping convection and hope it's fluid. And Lorenz, no, there's another book by Jim McWilliams on fundamental fluid dynamics, and a book by Joe Gadlowski, which is almost 800 pages. That's not highly recommended if you just want to. Okay, so uh, that's uh, just a, a brief review of the bibliography and I'm available now uh, for session if you would like. Yeah? So what I have is with the and on the white axis, the 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 phenomena with high energy on the Could you bring up the next slide? Well, let's do, let's do the previous one because uh, it's clear. You know, the other one, as I said, it fits the size of the planet. Uh, so, you know, after it's like this, it goes like that. You can't have any more simultaneity. Well, as I said, uh, it, it, it's not clear at all, okay? It's not clear at all why in a nonlinear situation where even in the linearization, these stochastic, the statistical operator and the dynamic operator do not commute with each other, why you would have this line on the back. And at one point, we tried with Valerio Lucarini to, to work on this, and uh, we just didn't get very far. Uh, so it's open as a, as a thesis problem, postdoc problem, life problem. <laughs> many scales and produce one and the other, and, uh, and the ratio of, uh, of the space and the, and the time of the structure is, uh, is a, let's say, well, not our operation, but the logarithms, and you have well, a linear relation to the logarithms. Ah, okay, so you're saying that it's just a uh, just, uh, consequence of uh, some sense of fractality. That's interesting. The fact that you find that this uh, state, relatively stable of the baby structures, every scale, uh, well, uh, uh, the inverse of cascade. Yeah, can you, let, let, let's go just a few slides more to the, to the great Janastro. No, no. Uh, I forget exactly where that. Yeah, more, more. Yeah. No, no, more. Yeah, this one. Uh, well, it doesn't quite persist because it goes from, you know, from fifth minus three to fifth to minus five thirds. Okay, it becomes truly three dimensional. This is three dimensional. Well, the, these are measurements, you know, these are measurements taken in the atmosphere from, uh, from airplanes. Okay, I forget exactly, you know, it's very interesting that I cannot remember for the life of me where the version with the colors comes from. In the papers at that time, you know, um, the journals did not have color. It was a black and white world. And I've tried, I changed correspondence with some other people that might have used this or might know. I have no, no idea where I got that. I think that the colors are different flights. Okay, that's something I, I don't know. But um, in any case, uh, you know, you can argue that this, this is what you're talking about, what would persist in the animals, okay? But then uh, as you go to further scales, you know, this of course would be at the low end 
of that diagram which uh, had the diagonal. Okay. So um, uh, it's an idea worth pursuing that uh, you know, we should talk about it separately during what will be available in these things. Because I know the details of the picture, yeah. but this yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed has to do with the three dimensionality and the cascade in three dimensions. Uh, yeah, be... but uh, you know, uh, the, uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, sorry about subjecting you to this different, can we go back to the, to the diagonal? The, the, the problem is that the two diagrams are in opposite senses. You know, this is the smallest scale, so the fear, okay? So those are the ones where uh, the stuff in the animals no longer have much to do. And this is stuff which is a still very much larger scales where the ocean comes in and uh, some, some portion of it, you know, roughly speaking, the portion where the stuff applies would be roughly from this point. So meso scale is is between the synoptic and this convection. Okay, so it would be somewhere from you know from here to about here. It could you know it could explain maybe that. That would be good too. That would be very nice. Particular things that have nothing to do with yeah, yeah, huge yeah, yeah. edges yeah. which move. Yeah. 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 You mentioned that uh, large and small scales presumably uh, contribute more to the understanding of large scale phenomena. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no, that's, uh, yeah, that's again, uh, that's, uh, that's a slide of Nastrom Gage, the one that, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is, you know, this is a pretty uh, important statement, but, you know, one that is uh, very hard to, uh, Really support the actual from data. It's more of a belief on efficient modeling, so to speak. You know, you can, you can, you know, these things do interesting stuff. And uh, what to do about what to what to do about these other scales? I mean, again. It's, it's a little bit, uh, can we go to that Murray Mitchell slide, please? The, the one with the combined spectrum. Uh, yes, this one. You see, uh, I didn't insist on this, but uh, the st standard treatment of frequency bands, you know, you think, let's say that you want to concentrate. You know, you cannot do everything at once. Uh, you know, the idea that you could have one model that explains all of this. Uh, just... So let's say that the sort of stuff that we concentrated on was a certain low frequency variability, you know, somewhere between these two things. Okay? So I think of all this stuff as being white noise or maybe, I say, color, because usually people, if there's a slope, people talk, talk about red, but there can be some other shades you know, other slopes of the spectrum, okay? So, uh, people just used to call this, again, in the jargon of, of field, especially of climate modeling, one calls parametrization, not what you call it in mathematics, uh, in parametrizing curves or arguments or something like that. Parametrization is to take into account the net effect of smaller scales, in terms of values of the larger scales. So you think of a grid box, okay, what do all the clouds on the grid box do? Well, they modify radiation that reaches the surface or escapes from the surface in a certain way. That's parametrization. 
So, uh, but the counterpart of that, you see, that's sort of very interesting that uh, one of the earliest and most imaginative contributors to this problem uh, was uh, my colleague Akira Arakawa, the first year later, came in 1985, known since I was a graduate student, who aside from looking at problems, uh, so-called uh, conservative numerical methods, energy and entropy conserving numerical methods, he also looked at this problem of planetizing the clouds in August and May. And already in those early papers of the 70s, he talked about ensembles of clouds. What he eventually did were really just deterministic. But he had clearly this idea in mind, which now has become one that we do pursue quite actively. You know, clearly a good way of thinking about the smaller scales is to think about them stochastically, and so the so-called stochastic parameterizations, as opposed to the previous deterministic parameterization. But it is still the case that even in the stochastic parameterizations, what you assume is a so-called spectral gap. No, nowhere to be found. You know, the idea is that there's some gap in the spectrum, and you can take everything to the right of that gap of being noise, and everything on the left of being deterministic, and there is no such thing. And so, a more systematic way of doing that is to try to think of random dynamical systems. I've probably done a lot of that for quite a while. And, then, and what you do to the left is, well, you keep the parameters. So for instance, if you're thinking about uh, quaternary uh, glaciation cycles, you, know, you take your frequency band somewhere here, okay? Uh, you think of all of this as being uh, noise, and here, for instance, it would be the position of the continents which you might allow to change slowly. Okay. On the time scale of uh, other thousand years, continents don't move that much. Slightly. Move that slowly, so you can think in modern terms of that as uh, being non-autonomous. So you no longer need to assume spectral gaps and all sorts of other ad hoc things, just integrate certain uh, arbitrarily imposed forcings, etc., but you have some sort of theory to that. So, uh, you know, thanks again for bringing me back to my slides. I can talk about Basically, by the end of the lecture, you will see how to do these things in a more self Yeah, okay. So, uh, at least I have to be honest. In this equation, this is a new idea. This is a new term. 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 I'm very similar to the visuals of two. Of the computer equation, which describes the weather. Uh, the water uh, in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, So, uh, there is some relation between the phenomena that we one function of 
Oh well, okay, okay, okay. I think I okay. So the 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 place the place where you see these equations usually in a fluid dynamics course is a one-dimensional version for channel flow. That that is what you say. Yeah, but uh, you know this is two-dimensional. I mean, it's basically you know it's the same kind of game of you. Dimensional analysis, you take your equations and you pull out uh, characteristic size and you form these non dimensional numbers, etc., and you decide that certain terms are negligible. Okay, so uh, it, uh, it's just, it, it just what you wind up with if you play that game under the suitable assumptions. And again, you can look at the details, I mean, either in the, those chapters of Gill and Childress or in this Gil Simone version of, uh, in the, in the Canard site of uh, in that book. Okay? I mean, I really can't do it uh, here. I have a blackboard and pray that it would take a little bit longer. But uh, this is a well-known piece of you know, geophysical fluid dynamics that you can find also in the other books of, you know, Cushman Roison or Jim McWilliams or whatever, but a short version is either one of those two. I, uh, you know, I, I found where the first time when I had to, to teach this, which was actually a dynamic meteorology course uh, at uh, Columbia University, uh, you know, NYU and Columbia, downtown and uptown in Manhattan. And uh, I, for various personal reasons, I wanted to stay in Manhattan after my PhD, so I got a postdoc at the Dalton of NASA, Dalton of Disney for Space Studies, which was just off the camp campus of Columbia, and at the time, the Department of Geological Sciences at Columbia had only 12 faculty, and they were all solid earth geophysicists, geologists, geophysicists, whatever. And uh, so I got to teach that course, and I found that these equations are really uh, very easy, you know, compared to some of the other stuff that you find in books. Standard book of dynamic meteorology is, for instance, the one of uh, uh, Jim Bolton, RIP, which I'm told is actually based on a very large kind of extent to a course that Ed Lawrence used to teach at MIT, where Jim Bolton had been a student. And so, uh, you know, it's not 800 pages like Joe Pedlowski, but it's longer. And uh, uh, if you have to teach this to stuff, to, to this up to people who don't want to do dynamic meteorology for the rest of their lives is a different 